The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize uh, our, uh, our marijuana. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rock Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs> I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Our government at work. Good day, Tokers and Tokats. Radical Russ here, live at the State House in Salem, Oregon, for this special edition of the Russ Belleville Show. Kevin Sabet from Project Sam, Smart Approaches Against Marijuana, is scheduled to testify here in Salem. In hearing room F, people are now beginning to gather, and uh, I've just spoken with Noelle Crombie from The Oregonian. She is in the room right now as well. Hearing room is beginning to fill up. We're going to uh, bring you live coverage of the hearing, starting here at 2 p.m., and see hearing room is starting to fill up here and uh we have provided for the people here that don't know so much about kevin sabet a handy guide i don't know if you can see that there the testimony to rebut and we have a number of people watching that right at the moment a number of different activist groups are in good to see this man here hey, Russ, how you doing? we're on live of 420 radio are you uh, right looking forward to the uh testimony today oh yes uh very much so a yeah. good, good chance for us to deal with the prohibitionist rhetoric straight on have you seen the uh slideshow that he's got prepared no i haven't let me grab you a copy of that this is uh this is the oh. slideshow that'll be showing right considerations for uh public health and policy and uh right off the bat we open up with one in 16s get addicted to marijuana, <laughs> which is one of the charts that I have in my rebuttal showing that the way he came up with that number was right. by adding up cumulative numbers. Sure. <laughs> yeah, and use is addiction. Yeah, and all use is addiction. That's right. So we'll be uh, taking a look at that. We will bring this uh, PowerPoint Excellent. back to uh, our show on Monday, and we will deconstruct this Very even good. better. We'll also have this recorded. We're showing this live on 420 Radio Excellent. as well. And you folks, be sure to check it out. You know, pull yeah. up these facts and spread the word. All this information, we need to get it out to the regular folks like yourself that's right all right so we're going to take a look around outside and then uh when we come back we will have our live coverage of this uh hearing here it's starting at 2 p.m pacific time just at the top of the hour so uh brian the red will be there in the studio at rolla j and probably kick in some music here for you until we get started so stay tuned i'm radical russ we'll be right back okay we'll open an informational meeting on uh, marijuana and call uh, dr sabbat please thank you Thanks very much, uh, Chair Barker, uh, <coughs> Chair Senator Polanski, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to uh, discuss marijuana policy and state responses uh, and, and the evidence uh, around the impact of use and what can be learned already from what uh, Washington State and Colorado uh, have been going through. Just very briefly, I have studied, uh, researched, and written about drug policy, drug markets, drug prevention, treatment, criminal justice policy, addiction, and public policy analysis for almost 18 years. 
Uh, most recently, I served as a senior drug policy advisor to President Obama's uh, White House Office of Drug Policy. Served previously in 2003 in the Bush administration and in 2000 in the Clinton administration as a researcher. Uh, along with Patrick Kennedy. Sure. Could you just take the microphone yeah. and move it away sure. from you because we're yeah. getting feedback. Great. Thank along you. with uh, former uh, U.S. Congressman Patrick Kennedy, I co-founded Smart Approaches to Marijuana a sensible third way uh, uh, marijuana policy organization that focuses on a health-based approach to our uh, nation's drug policies, in particular marijuana. And I'm the author of Reefer Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana. And uh, all of my testimony today is further detailed in that book. Um, so I, 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 you'll see that I have a written testimony for the record um, that, that I'd like to submit and as well as uh, a PowerPoint presentation that covers a lot of already what, what is covered in the written testimony. I'm going to go fairly quickly through the PowerPoint uh, that's rather lengthy. You have copies of them, um, and I'm very happy to, to take questions and engage in a conversation <coughs> on this issue. Um, well, just to start us, I think it's important to ground us when we look at what our rates of different drugs are in society today in America. About six times as many uh, Americans 12 and older dr have uh, you know, drink regularly, have, have taken at least one drink in the last month is the definition. Uh, about three to four times as many Americans smoke cigarettes regularly, 12 and older. This is all according to the National Institutes of Health. And about between 7 and 9 percent, uh, actually that figure should be updated, are regular users of marijuana. Um, so I just think it, it is interesting to look at the trajectory between our legal and illegal drugs in terms of the, the use rates that we have. The first myth, and I'll go through a few of them today, uh, is one that I probably get the most, which is that mar marijuana is relatively harmless and not addictive. And I think that a lot of people um, you know, have had that experience of it being relatively harmless and non-addictive, just as the majority of users, really of all substances, um, do not go on to become addicts. I mean, we should be very clear about cocaine uh, users, initiates, the heroin as well, and other drugs, certainly alcohol, um, that actually most users try the substance once or twice and do not go further. Marijuana is the same, uh, but the issue is uh, that even though a minority of overall users get addicted to any drug that we're talking about, that minority uh, of users can cause great social damage. And so what we do know is that if you're 16 and you try marijuana, one in six 16-year-olds, according to the National Institutes of Health, will become addicted at some point in their life to marijuana. Th uh, that is roughly the same uh, rate as alcohol uh, for adolescents. It's certainly lower than tobacco, heroin, and cocaine. Uh, but one in six and that 15%, which is the third bar from the left, is not a trivial number, I would argue. And in fact, when you look at treatment in this country, the vast majority of those in treatment are there for marijuana. About half of those people were referred by the criminal justice system, and about half were referred really by themselves or families or schools, etc. And the reason it's 1 in 10 adults, or 1 in 11 adults, between 10 and 11, that get addicted and 1 in 6 adolescents is because the adolescent brain is vulnerable, right? The, the brain uh, uh, is forming until about age 25 or 28. Anything that enters the brain or bloodstream at a young age has the ability to, to affect that person's life. Um, actually, in the good or bad, right? It's why we learn a second language when we're three or four years old um, versus when we're 40 or 50. Uh, it's much more difficult. Or why we learn to swim or ride a bike when we're young. Um, because our brain is developing, and it's harder to actually to do that as you advance in life. Drugs are the same thing. Any drug that enters the brain or bloodstream has the uh, at least potential. It doesn't happen to everybody. We should be very clear. But it has the potential uh, to, to become addictive for them. When I talk to a lot of parents and others, uh, even those who are regular marijuana smokers in the 80s, I think the, the striking thing is that the product <laughs> smoked really in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and by a lot of parents today, really does not resemble uh, the product that most kids are smoking today in 2014. And what I mean by that is we know that the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, which is THC, now remember, there are hundreds of components in marijuana, in fact thousands when you eat it up and smoke it, um, the psychoactive ingredient, THC, is the one that gets you high. Uh, there are other ingredients in marijuana 
Actually, scientists don't even know about most of those other ingredients. Uh, we know about a few of them. One is called CBD that you might have heard of. Uh, certainly, if you watched a recent special by CNN on, on children with seizures, you heard about CBD. That's very different than THC because actually THC gets you high. CBD doesn't. In fact, high CBD marijuana takes the high away from the THC. That's why there are medications in other countries that are very high in THC but also high in CBD that do not get you high because the CBD takes that away. Now, you probably would have guessed it, uh, CBD is not something that people growing marijuana and selling it to, to, to others to get high are going to be wanting to emphasize because uh, it takes the high away. You don't want a product that doesn't get you high. And so CBD has really been almost bred out of modern marijuana that a kid would get a hold of. Um, and would, Now, you can still find some CBD strains grown specially for certain patients in some medical dispensaries, but by and large, you know, a kid's access to, to underground market marijuana is not going to have CBD in it. But THC has grown, um, you know, as you can see on the chart, uh, uh, exponentially since the 60s and 70s. And that's why a lot of researchers think really the THC is the reason why we've seen a sharp rise in things like emergency room admissions over the last 20 years. Um, even though we have about the same number of overall users, more or less, from the early 90s to now, uh, we have about 20 times more that are entering emergency room admissions, usually from an acute psychotic episode of a high THC product of some sort. Um, and you know now we've risen to almost 400,000 emergency room mentions. Now, is that a high percentage of overall experiences with marijuana? No. So we're not here to say that you know everybody who smokes marijuana is heading to the ER tonight. The issue is uh, it is a risk. Like everything else, it is a risk, and we need to understand those risks. Risk. I'm not going to uh, dwell on this further, but you know, marijuana does affect parts of the brain, really primarily responsible for memory, learning, attention, and reaction time. Um, I think the reason why someone like Congressman Kennedy has put his name out there on this, uh, someone who has really dedicated his life to reducing stigma and discrimination for mental illness. Um, in fact, he was really the one, with, along with others, it was a bipartisan effort in Congress, as you all know, to have the U.S. Congress recognize that the brain is part of the body. Uh, which was something that was very controversial, actually, when it was uh, from a lawmaker's point of view, if you can believe it. And the, the nexus with mental illness, uh, schizophrenia and psychosis, is something that a lot of researchers are very, very concerned about. Um, we don't need to go into a lot of details about lungs, other than th there really isn't a link right now between cancer, a strong link between lung cancer and marijuana. We're still researching those issues. Um, what we do know, though, in, and I think this is very important for educators, in the state, because actually this is where it, it affects the jobs of those who are educating our, our children, and this is where I think teachers should listen up more than anybody, because they're the ones held accountable for kids, especially when they do badly in school uh, and when your schools fail at exams. And this is the finding that was pretty startling from last year um, that was challenged and then reevaluated, actually, and confirmed by, by, by many others, and including the National Institutes of Health, which was that r regular marijuana smoking uh, as a teenager, persistent, heavy marijuana smoking, um, was significantly connected to a six to eight point average decline in IQ by the time that person was 38, controlling for everything else, controlling for other drug use, controlling for uh, educational attainment, parental, socioeconomic factors. And that, I think, when we're, when we're trying to race to the top here, <laughs> education-wise, I think we need to think about what kind of state uh, that we're a nation that, that we're producing uh, when I don't think anybody argues that legalization and, and policies that open up accessibility will increase at least some levels of use. We can argue what those levels are among, you know, who they are among. But, but almost everybody, I think, agrees that, that we would have increased use with that. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details about dropping out of school, unemployment, um, social welfare dependence, absences, tardiness, accidents in the workplace. Um, this is, frankly, why a lot of businesses are very concerned about this. It will affect them and their bottom line. Um, I'm going to skip really very quickly through the medical part because that's not really we're really not here to relitigate medical marijuana that was passed in Oregon, except just to give you what my elevator one minute elevator speech or less is when I'm asked about is marijuana medicine and the answer is yes marijuana has medicinal properties but we don't need to smoke eat or vaporize it to get those properties very similar to opium right we don't smoke opium to get the positive medicinal effects of morphine thankfully we've moved on 
from needing to smoke a, a, a medicine to do that. And so I think we need to make a distinguish, you know, really distinguish between the components in marijuana that have medicinal value and raw herbal marijuana that we would smoke. And so that, I'm going to skip most of this because that's really the main thing. Other than to say, I think a quote that's really interesting when we look at uh, the leaders of the legalization movement, I mean, they said very openly that they will be using medical marijuana as a red herring um, to give marijuana a good name. And they've done a wonderful job at doing that, frankly, around the country. Um, the, this progression from medicinal marijuana to marijuana is one not only planned but very, very well executed. Um, I'm going to go forward. Well, one thing I think is noteworthy is that we know that, um, according to the most astute, you know, j journal looking at this issue, that drivers uh, intoxicated under the influence of marijuana are twice as likely uh, to get in a car crash. That's about compared to four to five times likely for alcohol. So yes, alcohol in terms of, you know, deadly or on the road, it is. However, I would argue we don't want either scenario to happen. And I think when we get into this very strange conversation about what's safe for one or the other, um, it, it really distracts us from the fact that, especially among young people and problem users, we want to discourage use of both substances. And when we look actually at heavy users, especially arrestees and also uh, those in treatment, those heavy users of marijuana are also heavy users of alcohol. So, so the, the, <coughs> the evidence among that high-risk population, which is a population we care about because they cause the social damage of this, um, really shows that these actually are used together. So we've got to be very mindful of that when, when discussing the, the different drugs and, and alcohol, etc. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I think one of the, one of the myths and, and one of the interesting things in Oregon here, you led the way in the early 1970s, I mean, the first state to decriminalize marijuana, I believe, 1973. And uh, what's interesting is that not only in Oregon, but around the country, it is very difficult to find people serving time in state prison, let alone federal, um, for with, whose only crime is smoking marijuana. When you take out all the other crimes, probation and parole violations aside, it's very difficult. And in fact, in Oregon, I, you know, I don't think anybody last night, I would like to see the stats, and I have looked at the statistics, um, especially because you did sentencing reform recently, is spending time in prison because of smoking a joint. I, I, you know, again, other than a probation or parole violation. So what's interesting is that, you know, I think a lot of people think that legalization is just about allowing an otherwise responsible 50-year-old guy to smoke a joint after work uh, at the end of a week. And let's give him a break and get the cops off his back. Um, I would say that's sort of the status quo, actually. And what, it's not what legalization is at all. What legalization really is, is the introduction of commercial sales. And the reason you have someone from the left, like Congressman Kennedy, someone from the right, like David Frum, joining us, and the reason why we have the American Medical Association that has a very similar policy as we do in a opposing the legalization of marijuana sales is that we are really concerned about the creation of the next big tobacco. That, that's really what this comes down to for us, and I'm going to talk about that um, in, in a little bit, and I'll, I'll move on. So essentially, this argument that the legality of alcohol and tobacco strengthens the case for marijuana. Uh, first of all, the use levels for alcohol and tobacco are much higher than for marijuana. Not among kids. Actually, kids smoke tobacco less. I would argue it's not because it's legal. That's been the case for 100 years. It's because we have a societal, you know, whole societal movement against tobacco. I don't see anybody waving the flag and saying we need to, you know, smoking tobacco isn't that bad for you. And in fact, we should note that we're having this hearing on the 50th anniversary of the Surgeon General's report linking marijuana, uh, sorry, linking tobacco smoke with cancer, 1964. I think it's ironic that we're maybe contemplating a similar, following that similar path as we did with tobacco. And I hope we don't have to to take a hundred years to learn and then re realize that we made a mistake in, in, in promoting uh, tobacco use, which, which we did for a very long time. Um, the second bullet, like I said, is really the, the one that I'm very concerned with, and that is the fact that industries uh, really promote addiction uh, and target kids, and that's what this is about. Um, you know, we hear the alcohol industry say enjoy responsibly. We hear that from other industries as well. You know, the interesting thing is, is that if everybody enjoyed responsibly their marijuana and it was just a 50-year-old guy smoking a joint once every two weeks, we would have no marijuana need for a marijuana industry. The same reason we would have no need for a tobacco industry if everyone smoked a, a pack on their birthday and that was about it. Um, addictive 
uh, companies rely on uh, these companies rely on addiction for profit because that's the only way to make money. You don't make money off the casual user. Las Vegas doesn't make money or give the Trump Tower suite to the guy that comes and plays blackjack with a hundred bucks once a year for his birthday. They give the Trump Tower suite to the guy that's betting the, his whole bank account on a regular basis. It's because that's where the business comes from. And the concern is not about, you know, I don't think people should be criminalized for low levels of use. Not everybody that uses marijuana even needs treatment or an intervention. But I don't see how we would go from that conclusion, jumping to we need to legalize and regulate this, because we've seen with tobacco and with other regulated substances that we're going to have wild and widespread promotion. And we are beginning that in Colorado and Washington, and I will talk about that in a second. But we have it with marijuana already. We have the, the pot entrepreneurs, as they're called. Called Marijuana Inc. We have multi-million dollar private investment groups that have started in Wall Street and other places investing in a marijuana industry. And I don't think these are facts that the American people know. I don't think that people who voted in Colorado and Washington thought that they were voting not only for a pot shop probably in their own neighborhood, but not only that, but also to support an industry who relies on glamorizing this and is it now announced themselves. This is, these aren't my words, folks. These are the words of people who are out there, they have said themselves, we are big marijuana. They want to create the marijuana version of a Marlboro cigarette. And they, they are encouraging investors to get in now while the gra or ground is running. Um, they want to create the Anheuser-Busch of marijuana, according to a, a multi-million, uh, multi-millionaire 29-year-old from Northern California. Um, they, they want to do that, and they're spending millions on lobbying in order to make sure that they have a friendly business environment to do their business. We even know that the tobacco industry themselves have wanted to get involved in this. A memo released that we were able to get a hold of because of the tobacco settlement showed that in the 70s, when the last time we were going down this path of legalization uh, in this country, um, that uh, Brown and Williamson, now Arch, part of R.J. Reynolds, I believe, um, basically had an entire consulting firm look at this issue. And they said, very much so, we will get involved in this. This is very good for us. Uh, we have the land, the people, the marketing. Why wouldn't we? And uh, I think that that is very scary. So th my big concern is not about the otherwise responsible adult smoking marijuana once in a while. It is not. My concern is about a new industry that, that, w that we call big marijuana. Um, I'm not going to go into all these details, but we have the confidential memos of the tobacco industry and how they lied to the American people for 80 years about what they were doing to kids and about how you know, they even had memos called Youth Cigarette New Concepts that we now have copies of. Um, I just can't imagine we wouldn't have this again for marijuana. And, you know, we got rid of the, the tobacco vending machines mostly in this country. Well, now we have marijuana vending machines. Four companies, one of which at least revenued $2.2 million last year. Um, that, now, this is supposed to be for medicine. This is under the, but now, it, it, you know, with full legalization, they're, they're ready to go. The advertising and billboards um, that are attractive. And I think something shocking to most uh, people that don't understand this, the candies and brownies and grape sodas that are, that are out there now, that are being marketed. Now, these are under the guise of medicine, let's be very, very clear. And I, I guess I don't know um, somebody with a, with a terminal illness that's going to be as attracted to a uh, you know, skeletal monkey with, on a grape soda bottle. But um, you know, they claim this is for those that are sick and dying. I worry about what this industry is going to do if we really go to full-scale legalization. I don't think parents realize that these are brownies, candies, sodas, lollipops, and items that are attractive to kids. It is exactly taking the playbook from the tobacco industry and executing it very well. Um, so I don't think there's any money in this, uh, and I don't think there's any money in this for you, for state legislators, at all. Um, I, I think that when we look at alcohol and tobacco, um, this is the case in Oregon and in all states, for every dollar that we get as a, in federal and state, for every dollar in alcohol and tobacco tax revenue, it costs us 10 in social costs. Now, what are the social costs of increased marijuana? Well, we don't know yet. Um, but we do know that you know tobacco costs that, and that's mainly the health costs, because tobacco doesn't cause car crashes. Tobacco is not linked with intoxication that doesn't allow you to uh, act properly at work, for example. Um, and yet, it, it still has those costs. So I, I think that we really need to think about this. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, the last time I checked, the state lottery um, here, and in most states around the country, in all states, no state lottery has been the savior for public education as we were promised. 
Um, so this is once again one of these promises of you know new schools and new roads if we only would legalize another substance, but it really is a charade. Um, you know, I'm not even convinced that we would have lower arrests. We actually arrest three times as many people for non-violent alcohol regulatory violations every year than marijuana and actually double all drugs combined. So this is actually about more regulation and, and it's uh, frankly you're going to have law enforcement and treatment are going to be more in demand because there's going to be increased users and increased problems that then they have to mop up. And it uh, doesn't mean to say that prohibition or what we're doing now, whatever we want to call it, in Oregon we call it decriminalization because that's what it is here um, for possession. It doesn't mean to say that that is perfect. There are obviously problems. We don't like the fact that money goes to bad people in the black market right now to do very bad things. That is a very negative aspect of current policy, and we should admit that. Um, but when we look, if the alternative is opening us up, a la big tobacco and opening it up to an industry which is again unless we're ready to repeal the first amendment what we're going to have when commercial speech is deemed free speech um, I think it's a real real problem um, I'm going to skip the myth about uh, Europe uh, I'm going to just go into what the federal guidance I think was and, and then Washington and Colorado clearly the Attorney General's office did not endorse legalization what they said is they're going to defer their right to challenge right now okay so they're going to let Washington and Colorado go forward they're going to look at certain things like drug driving youth use race advertising for youth um, and 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 try and gauge what the effects of that have been has been and I would actually argue as I did in front of the US Senate Judiciary that that this in some ways has already happened. Um, Colorado has the most open, next to California, the most open medical marijuana program um, you could imagine. I mean, talking of, talk about you know, more, more uh, dispensaries than Starbucks coffees in Denver. Um, and a huge lobby that has been growing for the last decade in, in Denver and in, the, uh, in Boulder and other parts of Colorado. So they've seen already before their legalization, in, you know, full measure went forward, what the effects have been. And, and I don't think they've been pretty. I mean, Colorado is above the national average of use. Drug-related referrals from high school students have gone up. Um, the second bullet is startling. Three quarters of kids in a treatment clinic, about 150 kids in a marijuana treatment center in Denver, report that their marijuana comes from a medical source that either they got themselves or they got from a friend who essentially faked an injury, um, an older friend. I mean, that is a huge issue of diversion. Um, anyway, on and on, uh, total car crashes have gone down from 800 to 600 in Colorado, except crashes with people testing positive for marijuana, THC, actually rose from about 25 to 55 uh, during the time that all car crashes went down, as you can see. Um, ER admissions, you're going to look at this graph and be puzzled. How could somebody under five be going to the ER, documented going to the ER in the Journal of Pediatrics for marijuana? Are they smoking marijuana? No. They're getting their hands on the edibles. And when you have a kid eating a marijuana brownie with 30% THC or 20% THC or even 10% THC for that matter, and that is going into the, you know, being affected by a five year old brain you're going to be spending the night in the ER, you can guarantee that. And that is exactly what dozens of families have gone through in Colorado since this has been opened up. Um, excuse me, excuse me. In, in addition... Excuse me a minute, Doctor. This is invited testimony, you're not invited. You speak up like that one more time, you're out of here. I'm getting tired of listening to your cracks. Thank you. Please continue. In, in addition, when the state of Colorado and the city of Denver actually hired an independent auditor to see how they've done, basically the independent auditor gave them an F. They had done very poorly. They had not regulated the system. Um, I'm not going to read the audit here, but it was it was embarrassing and damning. And it came out last August because you know they're finding out that a handful of doctors are giving thousands of recommendations. There's no control structure, and this is medical. So I don't see how we're now going to go from medical if we can't control it. And I know you've had challenges in the legislature of trying to lasso, and I you know, commend you for trying to do that, the, the program now, and at least have some semblance of control on it. We haven't even been able to do that here, let alone in Colorado. And yet, going towards full legalization, I think, should be questioned. 
Um, I'm going to address something that I know, having spent a few days in Oregon, has been coming up over and over, and that is, what if we could just write it ourselves? So the legislature could write the rules, the legislature could pass something that would be um, not you know, just something written by a lobbying group of marijuana, but hey, it's here to stay, we can't put our heads in the sand, let's do the best we can. Um, I mean, essentially, and I've seen the different proposals in the quote-unquote most reasonable one, it's essentially a carbon copy, very similar, to the ones in Colorado and Washington. And during the campaign, a lot of those folks said the same thing. They said, we're going to have control over this. We're going to regulate it. We're going to have control. And we're going to take it out of the hands of criminals. We're going to put the rules on. Let me tell you something. When this was passed in November, all bets were off. And what I mean by that is that every single reasonable regulation that you would have expected from a group saying that they want to be able to regulate this well essentially closed their ears and they've been voted down. Example. Denver City Council now is voting to allow 18-year-olds. It was supposed to be 21, and during the campaign it was always about 21, 21, 21. They said, don't ever mention 18-year-olds. Well, now it's passed. It didn't take more than a year for them for a proposal to be starting to go through now that will allow 18-year-olds. It will be decriminalized for 18-year-olds' possession. Um, they will allow character uh, edibles and candies. Uh, even if it's plain packaging, the actual uh, the actual figures will still be there. Um, governor Hickenlooper, a centrist, center-left Democrat governor of Colorado, who did not like what was going on uh, and would oppose the initiative, essentially now you know, he's governor of a state, he has to deal with it. He tried to restrict uh, magazines that outwardly and, and, and very loudly promoted marijuana. He tried to restrict them to people. Um, 18 and over. He said, at least we're going to put them behind the counter. You have to show your ID. I don't want a six-year-old to be able to accidentally grab this instead of the cartoon, the, the, the comic strip magazine. Um, and essentially, the minute he proposed that, it was struck down by a judge because of a lawsuit by the ACLU because of the First Amendment. Restricting commercial speech is very difficult to do. So I am one to believe that there is not a way for you all to do this correctly, that once legalization goes forward, it is in the hands of corporate corporate interests and other interests that, again, only make money off of addiction, okay, not off the casual user. And so I would just warn you about certain deals and other things striking because in good faith they're coming to the table and saying this is going to happen, we should try and do it. I'm not so sure it's going to happen not only in Oregon but around the country. And I say that really because we now have experience, Colorado just opened up retail sales a couple of weeks ago. And you know the picture shown on the TV, hey everything's great, you know people are waiting in line, they're so happy, there were no murders in line, you know that's our bar, nobody got killed so that must be a good policy. Um, well. What we what was not as reported as widely, but was reported, were a couple things that I think would shock most Americans, even those who voted for this, because they weren't quite sure this is what they were voting for. Uh, a two-year-old girl has already been sent to the ER with her parents spending at least a night in the hospital for in, uh, ingesting a pot cookie. The marijuana stores have declared that the high school student is their ideal customer, and they're really looking forward to the 18-year-olds that are now going to be coming to Colorado because of this. The state of Colorado was supposed to tag every single plant because this was a way to regulate and be responsible. Uh, marijuana plants from seed to sale, quote unquote, that did not happen fully and sales went on anyway. And um, the most popular website for those under 35 in the country, it's called the front page of the internet essentially, reddit.com, reported multiple posts of people talking about the smuggling routes from when you get your legal marijuana in Colorado, how to bring it to neighboring states, what roads to avoid because law enforcement are in the way, etc. And so this was in, this has been in the last two weeks. Okay, this started two weeks ago. We have no sort of you know obviously we don't have date numbers yet, um, but we have some of these. It's not evidence. The plural of anecdote is not evidence. I get that. I'm not saying it is, but I think it's important to report at least some of the stories about how the first and that doesn't mean that hundreds of people also got marijuana and they were fine. But these are happening. And I actually, you know, when this passed and, and has gone forward in, in, in January, um, I think in many ways it's woken a lot of people up. You have people from all political spectrum, all across the political spectrum questioning this, whether it's David Brooks from the New York Times on the right, whether it's Ruth Marcus, centrist in Washington Post writing, or whether it's uh, Tina Brown, a uh, very liberal, the former editor of Newsweek, now the Daily Beast questioning how marijuana use and increased marijuana use will affect the competitiveness of our workforce in the global economy. Okay. 
Um, I think you have a lot of people questioning this, and I would uh, just caution you to think that this is a foregone conclusion, that this is going to happen anyway. Yes, it's true that Oregon has been targeted, along with Alaska, this year by out-of-state groups that are giving hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to pass this and, and get signatures within a heartbeat. Yes, that is true. Yes, it's true that no matter what happens, this will likely be on the ballot. But it's also true that I think we're looking at Colorado and Washington very closely. And the Oregonians that I met this week that come from treatment centers, that man suicide helplines, that are out there on the front lines on this issue, that are preventionists, that are parents, even if they smoked themselves when they were younger, are now realizing is this what we really want here in the state and across the country? It is one thing to allow a responsible adult to smoke marijuana in the privacy of their own home with no negative consequences and as long as they're not getting in a car or, or doing something else that's going to affect us. It is a very different thing than to allow openly the quote-unquote regulation and licensure, the sales openly of marijuana which is bound to be commercialized. Um, I'm going to, well, I'm just, you know, for a minute, Project Sam, what we're all about is trying to find this, this rational way and discussion, which can often, unfortunately, as we just witnessed, be a, a shouting match between opposing sides that don't listen to each other. Uh, we actually try, are trying to elevate the debate in, in this country. At least press pause right now. Let's learn for these other states. It's going to take some time. What is the rush? Now, it is a rush if you have corporate interests in this. Yeah, you want to make money now. I get it. But other than that, what is the rush? Um, we think we need to press pause, at least have a rational and sane debate um, before really it is too late. Because once we open this to a legal market, good luck trying to reverse it. So, you know, obviously here are some of our allies and, and founders. Um, I, I'm very proud to say that the... Um, well, I'll, before I say that, you know, I just we're, we're testing some of this stuff out in terms of advertisements. But here, here's some examples of the edibles. I mean, and our thing is, you know, can you tell the difference? Probably not. You know, neither can your kids. I mean, this is what we're this is what we're dealing with. Um, and I think, you know, on the 50th anniversary of the Surgeon General's report, on the day of, we should remember something, which is that in 1964 we had advertisements. Uh, you're all too young to, to remember this, and I wasn't born, but we could look in the books and see that more doctors uh, <laughs> smoke camel cigarettes right, than any other brand, basically. I mean, we remember these ads. And then the AMA, despite them saying, actually, this is a serious health hazard. We need to be really thinking about what we're doing here. Today, we have these edibles and candies and all sorts of clever marijuana advertising, despite the fact that the AMA is saying that the sale should not be legalized of marijuana, that it's a public health concern. They just released this last month. And really, I think the question is, who will we listen to this time? You know, are you on the side of the AMA and the American Society of Addiction Medicine and all major scientific and medical organizations that have looked at this, the National Institutes of Health? Or are you on the side of the groups that, that, that want to see expanded marijuana use? And unfortunately, are all, some of the groups, not all, the ones that are funding this, some of them are linked to actually trying, they're more than just about marijuana. Um, let, let's be very honest about when we progress from medical marijuana to marijuana to other drugs, what the political agenda is about. So I would uh, leave you with that. Here's a quote from one of my heroes, Nelson Mandela, about the problems of drug addiction. Uh, his granddaughter, well known as being in recovery, um, and shortly uh, before his death, him talking about this issue and the concern. So um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman. I, I, I am very happy to have been here, and I'm, I would love to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, questions from the committee? Anybody? No questions? Okay, some of us have seen the presentation prior to today, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate me. it. I appreciate uh, it. Yes, okay, what, yes. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Yes. Well, uh, Ken Burns did a three-part yeah. presentation on prohibition, mm -hmm. and one of the lessons I learned from that was that it was actually harder to get a drink after prohibition than it was during prohibition. Mm -hmm. In, in the sense that you now had a regulated industry with people that would lose their licenses. Why wouldn't there be the same thing as it relates to marijuana? It's a very good question. I think um, we need to look at some apples, be careful about apple and orange comparisons with alcohol prohibition to today. First of all, alcohol was generally decriminalized um, more than, than, than just uh, legalized or prohibited during quote unquote prohibition. But more importantly, alcohol had been legal you know, since 
you know, for, throughout U.S. history, it was illegal for about a 10 to 15, whatever that was, period, and then made legal again. A very, I think, different history than, than our at least most recent marijuana laws. And I would also say that alcohol, in terms of being widespread available and accepted and normalized among the vast majority of Western population, we can date that to, you know, 5,000 B.C. Now, that doesn't mean marijuana wasn't used 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. We actually have evidence that it was. But in a widespread manner like alcohol, Alcohol, I think it is very different. So we have a, a cultural issue with alcohol, and and you know even every public health expert um, says, look, uh, we're stuck with alcohol. And in fact, not only are we stuck with alcohol, we're stuck with the accompanying industry. If you ever try and do anything against it, good luck. I don't know when the last time it was you raised alcohol taxes. Probably be, be a very long time. Um, I think about 40 years uh, uh, from what I remember reading about about Oregon and across the country. So the question is, do we want to follow that same path? Uh, as alcohol. Um, and, and what I would also say is, again, in terms of what's easier or not easier to get, I'm not sure, but what I do know is that the use levels are a lot higher in this country for alcohol than they are for marijuana. It is much more normalized. It's a badge of adulthood. Um, it's glamorized and promoted at every turn. When you look at Alcopops and the other things that the industry does very in a very clever fashion, I just don't see why that would ever want to be an example for us to follow for anything else. It doesn't mean that there aren't some bad people with <coughs> licenses that are making money from marijuana. That is true. And, and we got to figure out much better ways on the law enforcement side to deal with that. I'm not p putting my head in the sand about that. But you know, to make that comparison, when I, I thought the Ken Burns documentary was excellent, I'll just end with this point. Um, the, the point that I took away from it was to remember that when he talked about why we why we actually re legalized alcohol, and the primary reason wasn't so much that everybody was so you know drinking so much and it was a joke, but it was a lot. A lot of it did have to do with the money. It had to do with the fact that we were actually promised a repeal of the federal income tax at that time, because we were going to have revenue from alcohol. Well, that hasn't really worked out so well for us, I don't think. The revenue from alcohol not only doesn't, you know, is minuscule, it's a tenth of what the costs are. So, I, you know, there are some lessons from prohibition, um, but from alcohol prohibition, but I think the overall comparison we have to be wary of, of alcohol prohibition versus current marijuana prohibition. It's a great talking point for advocates because if they can compare alcohol prohibition to current policy, it's, win it's a winning point because most people hate alcohol prohibition, and so therefore they, they hope that most people hate marijuana prohibition. But I, I do think it's apples and oranges in many ways. It's just a bit. I wanted to follow up and get some clarification. You made a statement which I wasn't sure if I understood, and that was regarding how the uh, two laws that are now in Colorado and Washington State were passed. I got the impression that you at least were insinuating that the legislatures in those two states actually did that when I no. understand Sorry. that they were citizen <coughs> initiatives as compared to one of the proposals we have for our state is to take the uh, sit and wait to determine what is going to happen in those two states over the next eight to nine months before we actually would even embark on that and only after the citizens of this state st said that they wanted that as a policy so it, it seems like you're playing right into what I personally think is the best way for this state to go forward is to ask the question of the voters do you want this type of policy and watch to see what happens in those two states with the federal government and if they say yes in the citizen vote in November then we the legislature would take on that task in uh, uh, next uh, this year during the regular session so would you agree with that being the uh, approach to take well I mean I th I think that I, look, I, I, I think that no matter what we want or not want, this is going to be on the ballot in November. The question is in which route is it going to take to go on the ballot. And I, I, I misspoke if I said, or I was misunderstood, if I said that in Washington, Colorado, this was something that wasn't a ballot. It was clearly a ballot initiative. But, but the legislature and the local control board in Washington State, different local city councils, along with the state legislature in Colorado, are now essentially <laughs> filling in all the details um, right now. So in that way, I was making that comparison that even when they're trying to but fill in the details Dr. with something Sabat, positive. It wasn't, a, Dr. It wasn't Sabat, So if we actually took on and barked it on our own to actually put a policy question to the voters and sat back, would you agree with that? Would be I would not. Approach? And the reason I oppose that is because I think that is 
going to be done under the premise of this is going to happen anyway. Let's at least do it the right way from the legislature and not allow lobbyists to write something and get it passed, which is going to be much worse and put us at much peril. I think that assumes that this is going to pass anyway. And what I'm saying is that I'm not sure that's the case. I think, frankly, that uh, Oregonians are very smart, and when they see what's happening in Colorado and Washington, um, uh, they may take a second look. It's going to be hard because clearly there's a multi-million dollar effort to legalize it here in the state, so I don't know how equal the debate will be. Dr. Zabet, I appreciate you running on with more sure. than what I've asked, but we'd like to make certain we stay within our time frame. Sure. So regarding the statement you just made uh, during your testimony, it's okay for a re an adult to have a reasonable use of marijuana in their own home, but they shouldn't be able to go out and buy it on a commercial. So you're advocating that they should be able to do that, but they have to go to the black market to get their uh, their recreational drugs? Yes, because uh, it's they're all bad uh, policies, right? Prohibition is a bad policy. Legalization is a bad policy. They both have cons. In my opinion, based on, not my opinion, the American Medical Association and everyone else has looked at this from a scientific point of view, the cons of legalization are more than the cons of prohibition. But that is a con of prohibition, that you do have to go to an underground market. Thankfully, though, that market's a lot smaller than the alcohol and tobacco market from a public health point of view today, and those drugs are legal. Uh, Representative Tomei. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. So uh, on slide 77, you say that marijuana use among Colorado, Colorado teens is the fifth highest in the nation. What are the four higher uses? That's a good question. I know that uh, Vermont, well, I do know that the, I don't know off the top of my head, I get that answer for you. I do know though, that a recent study found that the top 17 states in 12 to 17 use were almost well, I think all to a T medical marijuana states, which is very interesting. Um, but I, I know I think Vermont takes the cake. Vermont and Rhode Island are usually on top. If you could get it to us, sure, a I will. Thank oh, you, Mr. Can I just say one one point to that too, though? If Denver were an American state, and I skipped this, but it's in the slides. If Denver, the city of Denver, were an American state, and that's where all the most of the marijuana dispensaries are in Colorado, it would have the highest state rate of public high school use in the country. Sure. Any further questions? Uh, Representative Hicks. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, doctor, so arguably, um, I am going somewhere with this, but I want to paint some background. Arguably, one of the most effective law enforcement campaigns that I know of, at least, in all, frankly, of American history, at least modern American history, was about 30 years ago in Texas. It was an anti-littering campaign. And they came up with this brilliant slogan that many of us know even now, don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. It's extremely clever. And the way that it got the litter cleaned up and has been effective even to this day, I think, is not that the legislature or anybody else came along and sort of passed a law and upped the citation and the police went out there. and It was that society, society itself, absorbed as its value that a clean environment is something that we want. Sure. And it became kind of socially unacceptable to litter. And throughout the nation now, we're an extremely clean country if you compare us to places overseas. Um, so is there data that you know of as to what, is there any way that we can gain an empirical insight as to what not legislators or advocates, or, but society, what are people thinking out there? Mm -hmm about marijuana. <laughs> well, obviously there are public opinion polls. What I would say, though, is that campaign in Texas, which was so uh, helpful, helpful, as you say, changed. And, and you could almost say the campaign for tobacco is similar in terms of the social, you say right, that. societal. That's the other one. Right. Tobacco is the best example right. even better but, than but, litter. Right. And what I would say to that is you don't have counter campaigns to that saying, actually, littering isn't that bad. Actually, there's a safe way to litter. And actually, we're going to create a framework because we want to control the littering. You don't have campaigns right now out there for tobacco saying, you know what, we're not quite sure about the science. I know the AMA says this, we're not, we're not sure. Actually, smoking might be okay. Actually, it might be one of the safest. We don't have those like we do for marijuana. So that would take a massive shift in how we feel about marijuana and how and where the lobby is right now with marijuana versus where the there are non-existent lobbies that I just made up for litter and tobacco. So, um, you know, and, I, and, and so I do think law affects culture in many ways and affects normalization. And um, I do think that when you legalize something, you normalize it and you accept it. Doesn't mean that, again, the opposite policy is perfect. It just means that what legalization is going to be bringing is an acceptance of the normalization. And in this case, 
making some people very, very rich. Whereas with the littering and tobacco examples, we don't have a pro-littering group out there. I don't see littering groups tro protesting on this. Okay. May I follow up? Yes, but you have pro-tobacco groups, and tobacco is the better example. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, smokers uh, Senator, <laughs> have to go a long way away now. And I know, even though we love to have you here, <gasps> I don't. I don't think those pro. I don't know what which pro tobacco groups you're talking about, other than an industry which has been more or less muzzled <laughs> by the fact that their own deceit was revealed in 1998. So I, I, I think there, you know, for every pro tobacco group you have, I, I don't know any pro tobacco groups, frankly, that are so vociferous like we have some of the marijuana groups. I think it's very different. And like, you know, the tobacco we have less kids using tobacco, even though it's legal. And I know people follow up with that. And yeah, it's been legal for a hundred years and we had a lot more tobacco use when it was legal 50 years ago but that's because as a society we did not take the dangers of smoking seriously and we had a lobby that made sure we didn't take those dangers seriously so I just don't want to repeat that for marijuana could you, could you explain where in your, your statement you said tobacco is legal it's not legal in this state for minors to have access to I was so saying for what in comparison to how marijuana would be legal, wouldn't be legal for minors either. It's for eight people 18 and over. But the argument is somewhat that even tobacco is legal for those 18 or over, yet smoking uh, rates are lower than marijuana rates for kids. So we should similarly regulate marijuana like we do tobacco for those adults to try and get those rates down. That's the normal criticism about the laws. That's what I was saying. Okay. Mr. Smith. I understand you correctly. Your premise is that if we legalize marijuana, it will, people, more people will use it, especially young people. Yeah. Is there any historical analysis on that? Because that seems to be the, 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 the focal point of, of your whole premise. So, is, so the analysis, right, we've never actually, well, we never legalized, this is the in modern era to legalize marijuana. Colorado is the first place to, to actually implement the retail sales. But what I say is backed up by the research that look, looking at how people are sensitive to price. And you can look at the RAND uh, testimony on this, and RAND has been very agnostic about whether legalization is good or not. They just put the data out, and what they, what they found is that legalization would drastically reduce the price of marijuana, therefore increasing use, because people are sensitive to price. That's why, again, the tobacco industry fights any increase in price through taxes because they're going to lose some of their customer base. Um, the other empirical the evidence I would bring up is, again, look at the rates of alcohol and tobacco, our legal drugs, versus the rates of use among all Americans of our illegal drugs. Of four times as many tobacco smokers than marijuana, six times as many drinkers than marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us about the funding of your institution? Where, where's the money? Coming? Yeah, uh, we are all volunteer. Smart Approaches to Marijuana is an all volunteer organization. So the director so Patrick, of the Policy Institute at the University of Florida, do you do any research? Are you getting any grant money? No, not getting any grant money. We're an uh, institute within the College of Medicine. Uh, we're focused on prescription drug abuse, smart justice measures, and other similar issues right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that'll, thank you very much. We appreciate your thank testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. That'll close the uh, informational meeting on the marijuana, and we will open. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you try it.